You are listening to Golden Otter Divinations, where the metaphysical meets the mainstream with Autumn Seibel. Tune in 9 a.m. Pacific, the first Friday of every month, as Autumn helps you manifest your dreams by connecting to loved ones in spirit, empowering you to find both physical and spiritual healing. Are you ready to transform your life and connect to divine guidance through practical strategies? Golden Otter Divinations is the place to find engaging interviews with medical experts, practicing mediums, intuitives, healers, and many more. Now, here's your host, Autumn Seibel. Hi, everyone. I'm Autumn, and you're listening to Golden Otter Divinations on Transformation Talk Radio. Stay with us for the next hour as we explore where the metaphysical meets the mainstream. Join us live each first Friday of the month at 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern, when we have new, informative, and engaging interviews with medical experts, practicing mediums, intuitives, healers, and many more to help uplift, educate, and empower listeners like you to find physical and spiritual healing. In a time of wrapping and evolving mindsets about what it means to live on planet Earth, studies by environmental groups warn of the need for drastic changes if the world hopes to make meaningful progress on climate change. To do this, it won't be enough for cars and factories to get cleaner domestically or abroad. The cattle, pork, and poultry industries, as well as our agricultural fields, will have to become radically more efficient as well. Before the agricultural industrial revolutions that afforded the exponential growth of the world's population, however, humans lived subsistence lifestyles, procuring their own food locally. Join us today for an invigorating discussion on what it means to be a hunter and gatherer in the modern age while turning an eye towards the future on how ancient practices and intuitive mindset shifts can feed the world's growing population. So my guest today is none other than my little brother, Austin Manelik. I wasn't sure I was going to introduce him as that, but this guy is so close to my heart and I'm so proud of him that I just want to shout him out. Born and raised hunting and fishing in Alaska, Austin always called the last frontier home. With an early affliction for filming, he took to the mountains with a camera, rod, and rifle. His passion for the outdoors, conservation, and being a role model for the next generation of sportsmen can be found in his films, articles, and social media stories. Austin is an advisory committee member of the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, founder of Mission Alaska, a Penn State alumni, proud husband, and father. Without further ado, welcome to Golden Otter Divinations, Austin. Hey, how you guys doing? So glad to have you on. This is like our first collaboration in, in this in this space. This is going to be fun. Co- collab. Wah, wah. <laughs> so to raise our vibration and really get in the flow, I like to start the show by asking all my guests if they've had any golden moments lately. So golden meaning a time you were just totally in the flow or an interaction you knew was sent by spirit or otherwise otherworldly. Something that made you smile and made your heart sing. Have you had any golden moments lately? Yeah, actually on the last hunt where I was packing out a mountain goat, uh, bringing home some finding meats. I found some meat and I was bringing it home to my family and it put me in a position where I was clinging to life. It's kind of in the balance there uh, for a few hours while I was coming across something something real gnarly as a, a mountain face. And I was carrying out a whole goat on my back. And I kind of I had this super human strength moment where I, I mean, I was packing at least my weight up and over a mountain face. And uh, if I didn't have that, please, Lord, help me now. Um, please, God, give me the strength. Uh, I, I, you know, I don't know what I've done. So I, I came home safely to my family. And uh, it's just pretty remarkable what a human's willing to do to bring home wild meat to their, to their loved ones. So that, wow. was, that was pretty golden to me. That is golden. Or just to get home to our loved ones. They always say that, like, women trying to get home to their children or try, not even get home to their children, trying to save their children can, you know, lift their body weight and, or lift the weight of a car, things like that. And you always wonder mm-hmm. where that comes from. And, um, you know, if the divine in, imbues us with superpowers when it comes to family and speaking of my nephew keeper and your son is back there. And that's why I think this um, episode is so meaningful for us because we grew up in a subsistence lifestyle um, in a rural town in Alaska And um, I've always wanted to unpack this because I, you know, we're active duty military. We lived all over the, all over the country and all over the world and procuring our food in the modern world takes on a different meaning than how we grew up. So something I want to talk with you about is hunters and gatherers in the modern age. So what exactly does it mean to you to be a hunter and gatherer in the modern age? So 
in this day and age, being a modern hunter, it, it's not just about providing food for your family. And in some places in Alaska, yes, that's absolutely true. And they kind of view it a little bit differently. Although the respect for the animal is um, utmost and the highest. Um, but really, if you're in the modern world, uh, like if you're in the Wi-Fi zones, um, <laughs> it's about, you know, it's about- I like that definition. If you, if you have Wi-Fi, you are in the modern world. I like that. It's <laughs> right. pretty- that's as good of a definition as we're going to get. Right. Well, it's it's not just, you know, about being a hunter or having like an ego or hubris and that bravado. It's it's really knowing where your food comes from. And there's so many different shapes to a modern hunter, whether it's trophy hunting, subsistence hunting, lifestyle. Um, it's just, it's interesting where it's evolved and it's kind of, you know, we're in the day and age of social media. So um, if you share these, experiences your message could be heard by thousands of people yeah so modern hunters have to be like very cognizant of their message and um why they hunt and furthermore why they share their experiences on social platforms so if you do share this message you've now become like an influencer and it's not just uh, other hunters that you're influencing um or even the anti-hunters but it's like the non-hunters um the generalists that really like can decide a lot for how that message is seen and portrayed. So seems like if you're a hunter and you're on social media now, like the real modern hunter, the next generation of hunters, um, you know, you're a public agent almost for hunting, in, engaging actively on social media. So modern it's, hunter, it's just, how deep do you want to go? I don't think we can cover well, this no, hour. We I could mean, just this, spend an hour on this uh, question. <laughs> <that we want. laughs> so this is something that we have talked about in our family for the last 30 years because we were raised in a subsistence lifestyle. And what that means is our father, mother, family, and friends were hunters and fishers, and they would go out and procure their own meats. Um, sometimes we would grow our own vegetables, but in Alaska with long winters and short growing seasons, that wasn't always practical. A lot of the people we grew up with did, and they canned their own foods. And in the summers, we would go out to the potato farms and the potato patches and dig as much up as we could and um, can and preserve those things. But uh, when we all went off to college, we more or less you know, joined the, the mainstream lifestyle of eating out and, and getting our food from grocery stores. And that's not to say that we didn't also do that growing up. Um, but the, the, the majority of the food that we would consume was from the earth. And we would know, you know, where that came from, what, what um, rivers the salmon were, spring, were swimming in, what um, land the moose were grazing in. And I always had a hard time as a kid. I was super sensitive. And you guys have always like, I I think I went fishing once and had to throw it back. I just was never, I never enjoyed it. It always made my heart break. And I understood that we were eating the animals to feed our bodies. And I still had a, um, I don't know, like a conscientious objection against it. Later, we'll talk about what um, the announcement that my six-year-old Ellie just made about chickens and how she's not eating chicken nuggets anymore because it comes from chicken. So this consciousness starts really early with kids. And if you um, can nurture it in a really healthy way, that's uh, the most advisable way to go. But anyways, what we were talking about is you're a hunter. I'm more of a gatherer. Now, as I am raising a family in the modern world in the lower 48, and now we're going overseas, I go out and I look for food that's um, ethically sourced. If it's not from the forest, what farm is it from? And, um, you know, how is that, how is that animal raised? And then how is that animal killed? Um, cause as much as I don't like saying that, that is what has to happen for us to go on. And I know I sound like such a, um, a tender heart, but I, I do believe that when we eat some, the meat of something, we are taking that spirit into us. And there's this, um, idea in, uh, metaphysics and it's kind of emerging in science, this idea of, um, cross transference species cross transference and it's kind of the idea you are what you eat and you can kind of like take on the characteristics of those animals we'll get into that another time but i'm going to ask you a question how can individuals become more conscious of their food purchasing and meat consumption habits so if they live in an area where they could hunt or fish how can they do that how could they get started if maybe they weren't raised in a lifestyle and if that's not an option what um what's available for people to purchase on the economy you know, like I know in some places they sell bison meat and things like that. Oh, wow. I mean, that's, where do you go there um, without just staying on a soapbox and, and preaching from what I know? But, you know, how how can you become more conscious of your food and like where 
where can you get started? I mean, there's, there's urban hunters like in the Pittsburgh area. I mean, any of the urban areas, uh, New Jersey, there's people who are, you know, have five acres on these huge, uh, multi hundred thousand dollar homes, sometimes million dollar homes where they've got deer, the deer coming into their yard and hunters are knocking on their door and asking for permission. Um, granted, uh, in certain states, you have to have hunter safety and, and hunter safety education. That's a course where you go. And really that, that teaches you the fundamentals of, uh, becoming a hunter, why you're becoming a hunter, uh, how to do it legally, properly. Um, and also kind of the history of hunters. So it's not just going out there and being able to like legally hunt, but like really like backtracking uh, on the importance of your decision to go in and get your hunter education. So if anybody's interested, I suggest they go in and get their hunter education. Uh, every state provides them. There's online courses, and then you have to take a shooting proficiency course. Um, and then there's mentorship programs out there. But I mean, everywhere from urban environments all the way out west and into the wilds of Alaska. And there's so many different ways that you can get involved, and it's just like a, a click away for the modern hunter. I mean, um, in, in certain states, you actually are required by state law if you are born. I believe it's uh, 1986. Uh, if you're born before that, you don't have to take your hunter education, but I suggest it. And I've actually gone to, I can't tell you how many times I've gone if to you're 33 and up. <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> they don't want to tell you what to do if you're like Hand a raised. serious adult. <laughs> right. Um, but the, yeah, there's, there's plenty of ways to get involved. Uh, hunter education, um, hunter, I think it's hunteredonline.com. I, I okay. should have uh, pulled that up before I went, but that's the way you can get involved. And Very you know, cool. there, there's also conflict with, uh, with, with that being, you know, if you're hunting in urban environments, and, so and different people's feelings. So really uh, feelings, then if, you, if you're not doing it correctly, you can get on the wrong side. So you're saying quick. educate so yourself, get educated, there's, there's what's yeah, available in your absolutely. area. That's the first thing. Yeah, and, and there's so much in in depth once you, once you like peel back a chapter, you're like, yeah. oh my gosh, there's volumes on it. But I mean, humans by nature, we're, we're meat eaters. We evolved that way. It's in our DNA. And, you know, so I won't speaking lie. of, oh. We got to take yeah. a break, but when we come back, we will talk about that because that's how that's what's next. How can we make peace with make with eat eating meat? And are there any practices hunters can do to bless the meat and release the soul of the animal? But we're going to take a break. You're listening to Golden Otter with Autumn Seibel. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll have more on what it means to be a hunter and gather in the modern age with Mission Alaska founder Austin Manelli. Stay tuned. We are back on Golden Otter Radio with me, Autumn Seibel. My guest today is outdoor enthusiast and woodsman extraordinaire, Austin Manelik, who's talking with us about the difference between trophy hunting and feeding families by knowing the source of our food. But before we continue, I want to make sure everyone knows how to contact him. So Austin, could you please give us your contact info for listeners? If you really want to get the inside scoop, you're going to head on out, out to uh, Instagram, mission underscore Alaska. That's where you can find all the links to everything and keep up to date with my story. And if you want to buy any sweet swag like this golden ghost shirt that I got, <laughs> missionak.com. Missionak.com is your website. And then you are on Instagram at mission underscore Alaska. Oh, yeah. You can find me anywhere online. Mission <laughs> AK for show. All right. That's the inside fact. All right. So now we're going to talk. Um, we're going to move beyond trophy hunting. We're going to talk about 
moving beyond trophy hunting to feeding families by knowing the source of your food. Okay. So without getting too heated and too wild, because we have had this conversation for the last 15 years between the two of us, what do you say about trophy hunting allegations? Because like you were saying earlier, when you um, are on a public platform, you can draw the ear of people who would, you know, say that you're just doing it for the trophies. What do you say to that? So trophies, regardless of, of what animal you harvest, whether it's a button buck for your first animal or a trophy whitetail buck or anything in between, um, even big game like uh, Alaska trophy bull moose. Well, if you take the, that animal and you just take the trophy value, um, to some people it's the horns, to me it's or the antlers, to me it's the meat. If you were just to take that out of the field, there is serious consequences to that with the law. Like you will be yeah. arrested. You will be fined if you were caught. So that being said, you can't really technically be um, a trophy hunter and just hunt for the meat. So you can take the, you can't, everything uh, of the meat, of meat value has to be removed from the field before the trophy can even be removed from the field. And it's, once and again, that can require multiple trips, right? If you get a moose Absolutely. and you're packing it out by yourself. Yeah, it's really tough. So that being said, that's, that's where that lies. Like if you, if you take out the trophy value and leave everything, you just become a poacher, potentially a felon. There's serious, there's uh, the interstate compact, which if you have one violation, you can be penalized and lose your hunting privileges across the entire 50 states besides Hawaii. They're, they're like the last one to join. So at any rate, Trophy hunting is, you know, is what it is. The meat is going to go to a place uh, so you can donate the meat when you're done. But you have to get the meat all the way out, and it's got to be edible. And you can donate to programs like Hunter for, uh, Hunters for Hungry, um, food banks. There's all sorts of places that take uh, meat. So, and, and basically, to be a, a trophy hunter, I mean, e even that being said, you're going to spend, if you're going to go to another state and hunt, if you're going to hunt your own state, you're spending money on uh, hunting licenses, uh, your tag fees, transportation to get there, you're stimulating local economy. And then with, you know, following that, you got the North American, um, the North American model of wildlife conservation. And you also have the Robertson Pittman Wildlife Act. So anytime that anybody spends any money towards hunting, fishing, um, outdoor recreational shooting, there's an excise tax that goes directly into, into the federal fund and the state agencies where that money funds biologists to stay in the field, biological research. It funds wildlife troopers. It funds all these different things to keep it going. So hunters, even if you're a trophy hunter and you're spending your money, that is going towards wildlife conservation, 100%. So, That's you know, if that, was, that was a conversation you and I had maybe – five, six years ago, we really got into it. And I was just like, you know what, Austin, it was, it was around when Mission AK was really starting to ground, like gain a following and you were, you'd started the business. It was an official thing. And as your sister, I was like, oh man, I love you and I want to support you, but I just, I, I can't get behind this hunting stuff. And, um, you, you really did educate me on the amount of money that hunters and, and fishermen bring into the domestic economy to, um, to preserve our resources, to pre preserve our, our lands and, and water sources, and just the natural resources that I wouldn't have thought that um, hunter money goes to. Mm -hmm. And that was something that I don't think having, if I didn't have you as a brother and having been raised in the family, it's not something I ever would have investigated. I probably would have just vilified and said like, hunting, it's not for me, don't like it, don't, not into it. But this is part of our soul's journey. This is part of our family's journey that we are. We were raised in the same house, but have different views on the same subject. And um, yeah, getting educated is a, a good start. And so, well, think, think about this. Think about this. Market hunting, like the North American buffalo and bison, they are almost hunted to extinct because people like meat that much. Well, yeah. once you start putting value to a resource, like a like a trophy, like an animal there's people who are willing to go and pay for that. So you have the North American model of wildlife conservation and they outline some things. So that's the two takeaway things that I would say for anybody listening is to look at the first, the Robertson Pittman Wildlife Act and actually see where these hunters dollars go and also the North American model of wildlife conservation. And here's some bullet points for the North American wa uh, model of wildlife conservation. So the wildlife is as public trust resources. So these are our animals. We own them. The states don't own them. We own them. So people are paying for them. That's why poachers 
get in serious trouble because they're part of the public. Um, and then number two, we've got the elimination of markets for game. So market hunting, we are protecting animals so that we don't have a buffalo uh, disappearance like we did. We almost hunted them to extinction, uh, the brink of not ever coming back. So mm -hmm. number two, the allocation of wildlife by law. So hunters are paying for uh, law enforcement to keep it in check. So you can't just have somebody going out rogue and shooting animals and lopping off the head. That's not okay. And so uh, that's number three. Wildlife um, should only be killed for a legitimate purpose. So think mm -hmm. about that. Wildlife is considered an international resource. All these people are coming overseas who are coming and like experiencing um, tourism and, and to hunt. And their meat is the same thing. Um, so, and then uh, also the, the science is the proper tool for discharge of wildlife policy. So back to biologists um, and the state agencies, and I, I, won't, I won't get into the federal agencies and trying to control state resources because that's, that's an interesting subject. And then also the, de the democracy of hunting. So that's the North American model of wildlife conservation in a nutshell. And, and we, could, we could go into depth there. That's a main, Absolutely. so that's the more mainstream talk on hunting. That's like the brass facts of kind of what's going on in our country um, with mm -hmm. hunting. But I, you know, I want to go a little bit more metaphysical and I want to talk about, um, is it, is, is it, is hunting to you about the hunt for the animals? Is it about the meat for your family or is it the preservation of a human legacy. I mean, before we had the industrial and agricultural revolutions, we had to go out and hunt and gather our own food. So even if you didn't have big game where you were, um, humans had to fish, humans had to gather. What is what? What do you say to that? To like our ancestral roots as as human beings? Yeah, it's it's, it's in our DNA, and like, there's it's hard for me to kind of ball it up and and package it up in a nice bow, uh, but it's if, if I didn't have hunting or just like the opportunity to get out and give back to her nieces, nephews, um, even my wife now, she's, she's got into hunting. Um, and yeah, it's, a, it's like an intangible part of our DNA that you just, you can make all the arguments you want, how you do it, where your dollar is going, but there's something about going out and having like this mission, like a purpose where you're going out. And it's like, it's really tough to get to some of these places. Yeah. And, that's a lot of money. I mean, like just going out to our family cabin, there's a plane ticket to Hawaii gone. Yeah. You know, you're looking at 300 Gas, bucks fuel. To get out there, fuel, yeah. and you're stopping, you're getting groceries, the local, you're, you're stimulating yeah. local economy. So it's, it's like all this stuff that makes you feel good about it. And then quite honestly, when you do take an animal, like there's, there's like this hunter remorse and you know, there's like uh, you know, five steps of being a sportsman or a, uh, you know, an, an outdoorsman and, and like actual hunting. Um, mm -hmm. and you can go back and forth, but there's, there is a sense of when you first get into it, you're really excited. And then you, then you're just going after trophies and then you're getting, giving back as a, you know, conservationist, and a sportsman. But, um, at the end of the day, there should be some sadness because, you know, you're turning the lights off permanently to an animal. Yeah. And if you don't feel that sadness, um, at some stage in your life and you, and you can't portray that. Uh, it, it just, it, it honestly just reverts back to, um, you know, the, the apocalypse of now we just have, now we just yeah. have to take an animal to survive. And even then, um, you look at the, the native Americans and, and how they felt about taking an animal. Yeah. Yeah. And they would bless I, them. And yeah. So that's like what I do every single time I do it, take an animal's life, even no matter who I'm with, I take a minute. I give them their last drink and their last meal and I say, thank oh, you very much for you. Like, that's going to so, make me cry. Like, that's why I'm, I am such like in a personal zone of conflict where I still every now and then eat meat and then I feel guilty about it. And it's this weird, like mind trip where I know that my body needs it to be its best and to feel the, like best. But I also know that plants can give me that and moving away from the need for animals because at the end, like, like you said, like, they are giving us something, and um, we'll talk more about this. we got to take a break in a second because I want to talk more about um, do we think that humans will ever evolve away from the need to hunt animals or slaughter animals because we really have moved away from that um, as in, in bulk. I mean, if you look at the billions of people that there are in the world, there is not enough natural wildlife to feed that population, and so we've gone into more um, modern uh, food production technologies. But um, 
hold that thought. Let's 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 really talk about this when we get back. You're listening to Golden Otter Divinations. I'm Autumn Seibel. We'll be right back. We are back on Golden Otter Radio with Autumn and my amazing guest today, Austin Manelik, founder of Mission Alaska, who is here discussing environmental considerations, protections, responsible resource management, and wildlife activism. So before we went to break, we were talking about, do we think that humans will ever evolve away from the need to hunt animals or slaughter animals? And what would that world look like? Um, during the break, we were talking about how there was just a huge uh, beef recall. 12 million pounds of beef was contaminated and had to be um, discarded. 12 million pounds of beef. How many cows died for that meat? And when you look at a subsistence lifestyle, you know, how much um, time and energy goes into hunting a wild animal versus how much time and energy goes into um, producing mass like beef, poultry, um, or pork products. And we were briefly talking about how those animals, um, are raised and how it can be often, oftentimes inhumane. And we're not getting on the people who have the small family farms and the the organic and the grass are, this is not like a tear down. This is a, a spiral up conversation where we're all just trying to elevate our consciousness and awareness around this conversation and how, um, you know, we may look the other way when somebody throws half of a hamburger away that's uneaten or some meat that goes bad. We may not even bat an eye at that. Um, but if somebody were to, if a hunter were to do that, it would be finable, quite honestly. And um, I do often oh, wonder, waste. like, yeah, it's waste. And I, I do wonder sometimes if, especially in the United States, we have, um, a, you know, a, an obesity epidemic, diabetes epidemic, our national health is really declining. And I do wonder if there were um, larger, like larger price tags for things that, um, like meat specifically, that we would, we would, um, it would be more of a delicacy and less of a consumable that can be wasted. And through that, um, we would be saving animals' lives, and we wouldn't be breeding animals to be slaughtered, which just feels really. Um, I don't know. The energy of that feels really upsetting to me. And I recognize that as a human, um, I need some s form of protein and meat. And I'm, I hand raised as a hypocrite because hi hypocrite, <laughs> hypocrite, because every now and then I will eat meat, but I always have this internal dialogue about it. And the other day, um, Ellie, my six year old, we were in the car, getting ready to go get dinner, um, after a long week. And she goes, you guys, I need to tell you something. And we said, what honey? She goes, I'm not getting chicken nuggets. I'm not eating chicken nuggets anymore. And we said, why, Ellie? Like what? And she goes, chicken nuggets are made of chicken. Why didn't anybody tell me? And she was really upset. Like we had pulled the wool over her eyes. And um, and so now we are not eating meat as a family because Ellie is like policing my meat consumption. But because I have a very accountable little buddy keeping me accountable, every time I go to make those decisions, I am conscious about it. And so that's all the purpose of this conversation is. We're not on a pedestal. We're not on a soapbox. We're just trying to elevate the um, our conscious collective about this. If you take a look at commercial harvest of any animal, it's it's um, it's not pretty. Usually when there's a, no, a large yeah. mass opera. Yeah, it's not. There's okay. a lot and of documentaries even, on it. There's yeah, a lot of yeah. really good documentaries on it. Once you take a look into it, you're like, ooh, this is kind of like dirty, almost like, yeah. oh, this is tainted, even though I'm like, I've had steak and like, I've had yeah. really good ribeye. And I'm like, it's good. I'm going to eat it. But I feel 
tainted, no you know? Good. And you know what, if you're taking in meat, so there's this thing um, in metaphysics called Carilion photography, and it's actually not so metaphys metaphysics anymore. It's the idea that we can actually capture the electrical current of um, our food sources. So like if you take a picture of an apple or a piece of broccoli, it's like, especially if it's freshly cut or just like fresh from the vine, it's literally electrified and it's like a living food. And then if you take a piece of like meat, like dead meat, it still has electrical impulses, but it's a little bit duller. So you can Google it. Kirillian hmm. photography, K-I-R-I-L-I-A-N. I just wrote a ritual about it, um, feeling the energetics of our food. And um, I had my members go through like the grocery store and feeling the energy of the different foods that you could purchase. And if you hold it in your hand, even without reading the back and knowing if it's locally sourced or organic or pasture raised, but just feeling it and knowing like, is this... Um, <clears throat> something I want to put in my body because ultimately what we put in our body feeds our soul and feeds our spirit. So before the break, we were talking about environmental protections, resource management and wildlife activism and uh, how you got involved in that. And um, we talked a lot about how restricted um, licensed hunting and fishing in the, in the United mm -hmm. States funds, the preservation of natural resources. And mm -hmm. um, right now we're sort of talking about what the, if there are any lessons that the cattle, poultry, or pork industry can learn from natural resource management. Anything you want to add to that before we move on to the next question? Well, even like if you just, that's a, that's a beast. That's a follow, track the money. Where is the money going? What, what is happening? Obviously if people are going to consume it, mm -hmm. then there's going to be a market for it. Mm -hmm. um, now, like look at if you're not into hunting or you're an anti hunter and you're like, well, I only eat vegetables. When a combine goes through a field and harvests those fruits, vegetables, whatever it may be, they're going through and killing millions of, and it, depending on the size, but thousands, mark it down, voles, moles, rabbits, they're going through and tearing it up. So it's like, well, I only eat, you know, I, I only eat uh, vegetables. Well, it's like, hey, you still have blood on your hands because they go through and of course the deer love. They love to eat that, you know, the, the vegetables there and, and, the, and the food that people have grown. So they're killing all sorts of animals, innocent animals. So whether it's the uh, beef or the meat industry. So you're talking about on, on large, large scale. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so, so when you can buy as close to the forest or as close to the farm as possible and meaning forest, um, just re research where your food comes from is the, is the basic, is the bottom line. Um, is the bottom line. And also knowing that you're per you have purchasing power and every dollar you spend is a conscious choice and you're either mm -hmm. adding to the, yep. to the issue or taking away from it. And when we consciously withdraw our dollars one by right. one, things change. And, and that's, oh. that's the bottom line. Um, so we were talking about, we talked about how you became involved in resource management and wildlife activism. You grew up doing this and um, mm -hmm. decided to take on a more interactive role. And then mm -hmm. I want to say, like, how have your views on hunting evolved over a lifetime? Because you, you grew up in the lifestyle and you're still with it. I grew up in the lifestyle. I never really liked hunting and fishing. I would go along because I knew that I loved camping. I still love camping. But the hunting and fishing was just never for me. I would have rather picked a bunch of berries and and dug up a bunch of carrots. <laughs> what well, say you? Well, it takes gatherers, yeah. We yeah, it takes need... gatherers. <laughs> well, so first, uh, you know, when I was an undergrad, I realized I wanted to become part of the shot industry, the shooting, hunting, outdoor trade industry. And so naturally being a hunter, mm -hmm. uh, Penn State, uh, I had anti-hunters throwing all sorts of haymakers at me. And I had to like hone my message and like understand, okay, what I'm yeah. doing is conscious effort. And I realized that all of my arguments, no matter how articulate, um, I could preach about the Robertson Pittman, I can preach about the North American model of wildlife conservation, I could preach about all those things, but that doesn't mean it's going to stick because some people will make feel based arguments versus scientific fact based arguments. And so I would just would go back to scientific based and then try not to get high level. I know I like to get excited, but try not to get high levels. Like, Hey, like I know what my dollars are doing. And that's now after going off and coming back and, and really realizing I'm not going to change these opinions. I started getting involved in regulation change, which regulation change 
you know, there's the board of fish and the board of game in Alaska for uh, that make changes to the hunting and fishing regulations. Mm -hmm. And there's advisory committees that take in these proposals and say, oh, okay, I see what's happening here. Vote yes or no on it. And you have a quorum of individuals to change and to protect animals or to harvest a surplus. But basically just being a part of top down regulation change and then also trying to keep some of that noise out. When you read a proposal that comes from an anti-hunter, you read a proposal that comes from a non-hunter where it's like, okay, let me just, let me read this, think about it. You, you're in a quorum full of uh, individuals who are much more saged and um, experienced than I am. So sometimes my opinion changes based on what somebody else says in this room. And then that goes up the board to the board of game. And sometimes they listen, sometimes they don't, but they take advisory committees more seriously than they do just some Joe Schmo comes to the board of game and says, Hey, I've got a problem with this, which there is anti hunters. There's all sorts of people, but it's kind of uh, like Robert's law. It's really controlled. Um, it's like local then, activism. No, would you, would you consider all of this local activism? Yes. And, but it's across the entire state. So there's all these different advisory committees that are across the entire state of Alaska. Um, and they meet up and basically they're trying to, influence because Alaska is huge. They're trying to influence their individual area where they recreate. Mm -hmm. So Does that's where I in the lower 48 as well across the US? Um, I some believe capacity. in some capacity and more people are uh, it's not just because at the board of game you can have somebody at the board of game that has a political agenda. Now we're getting into politics as an okay, absolute let's not get into the agenda. Politics. Oh goodness gracious <laughs> there's people there's lobbyists there's all sorts of stuff. Oh like, yeah track the dollars what what is this funding what does this go for so i, I don't know speaking we, we need... of funding we have to take a commercial break <laughs> oh, goodness gracious <laughs> how deep do you want to go no we we really do have to take a commercial break so um you're listening to golden otter radio when we get back we'll have more on um more with millennial outdoorsman austin manelic stay tuned we'll be right back We are back on Golden Otter Radio with me, Autumn Seibel. I have millennial outdoorsman throwback, Austin Manelik here, founder of Mission Alaska, discussing the bridge between the metaphysical and the mainstream. Now he's going to give us more information on how we can each be responsible stewards of the Earth's resources and begin to meet, make peace with eating meat. So um, before we went to the break, we were talking about um, if we evolve a, as a species away from the need to hunt for our food or to possibly even eat meat. What are ways we can preserve our uniquely human heritage as hunters and gatherers? So we were just talking about that, how you um, you really enjoy the hunt and it's less about pulling the trigger, in fact, very little about pulling the trigger and very much so about the adventure, packing the family up and going out and um, exploring new lands and exploring new territory and having having a genuine adventure you don't know. Like you've told the story at the top of the hour during your golden moment segment um, that you were packing out from a hunt and you didn't know if you were going to come home or not. I mean, it doesn't get much more adventurous than that. And in the modern day, that's a um, really unique way we can preserve our human legacy. But then there's gatherers like myself, and we will talk about what gatherers like myself like to do in the woods in a minute. Um, but what are ways that you think we can preserve our uniquely human heritage as hunters? Oh, man. Getting out and recreating. I mean, every dollar counts going out and like stimulating local economies in these small towns, going out and exploring. Humans are explorers by nature, but, mm -hmm. and you don't, I mean, you can live, sure, you can live a great life without eating meat. You can, you know, combine rice and beans and you can do some stuff, but at the end of the day, like you want some rocket fuel, you know, you're going to want some wild game after a while. So, <laughs> um, basically, we were talking about the agricultural. Um, harvest of food and you know they're being you know blood on everybody's hands so to speak and it's like well 
I don't know what we do. I don't want everybody to be a hunter. You know, there's all sorts of gatherers and there's things that grow wild, but yeah. it, because all these public lands, you start looking at public lands and crowding and resource crowding. Yeah. Um, like I talk about resource yeah, crowding, like in Alaska during salmon season. Oh Ooh, yeah. Those well, it's river banks outrageous. there. Right. And it's feast or famine. It's like, go catch your fish now because the salmon have, have to reach their escapement to be able to spawn and come back. That's all set in place by fishermen's licenses. Mm. So a certain number of salmon get by, then, hunt, uh, then, then anglers can go ahead and go to the riverbank and start catching these fish because they already have their number of fish that are going to breed. That's mm. the same thing with animals, the carrying capacity. The, the departments of fish and game across the United States are not going to over harvest uh, generally animals. If they do, then they go back to the drawing board. They say, okay, we've got to close hunting this area because, you know, there's too many animals taken and needs to bounce back. Mm-hmm. That's the same thing with predator management, and we can go down that rabbit hole later. Yeah. But um, basically, well, let's go down a more metaphysical rabbit hole. How can hunters and fishermen add a spiritual element to their hunts? Is there a way to um, bless or or Thanksgiving that they can give to the animals? You talked a little um, bit about that. When you when you get out and you do it enough, and you realize like you're you're not really going out there like I always call my outdoor sermon. You're not really going out there to catch, even though that's like one of the main goals, to catch your fish or catch an animal, kill, kill your food, take your food, and know where it came from. Mm-hmm. When you start getting out, you start really thinking about it. And this is like the level of sports. And once you do it enough and you really realize like, wow, I like this, I'm excited about it. And then you keep, go out to get that, capture that same excitement. Mm-hmm. But you're also realizing, you know, and you're sharing it with people is you are, you're passing it forward to the next generation. And they are going to be the protectors of the realm. They're going to be the ones who are protecting the resource because they're buying their licenses and they're going out there and they're going and doing it. And when you give back, you know, like it's not about the hook or the catch. It's, it's, it's about the adventure and about the exploring. So if we didn't have hunters and fishers that were fighting for our public lands and keeping our public lands public. Um, we'd have an entire our national forests, our, our public lands, BLM lands, they would all be developed. And yeah. all of a sudden there's, you know, that's why you have high rises to accommodate more people. Cause yeah. once you have that fringe, it takes away all the natural uh, animals habitat. So it's like, you really got to start just thinking about it, track the money and what hunters and fishers are actually doing. They're preserving wild lands, not just for hunters and fishers, but for people to get out and adventure and explore and to go look for their adventure, however they want to have it. Okay, so to get a little bit more metaphysical, because you know how, you know what I do, I'm a medium, I talk to people on the other side, and I know that animals transition as well, and we talk a lot about like Mm -hmm. horses and cats and dogs and domesticated animals, Mm -hmm. and when they transition, how they come visit us from the Rainbow Bridge, and that's pretty big in the um, metaphysical mindset. There's a pretty firm understanding of that um, in my neck of the woods, if you will. Um, but I sometimes wonder about um, wild animals and if when they are taken, they if their souls are released in a um, respectful way, if they if they also see that as a um, a blessing to the land and they see their mm-hmm. their overall contribution. Um, I don't know. Maybe maybe I'll maybe I'll have um, somebody on who can talk a little bit more about I, that. But I I wonder that. I've got something for you. What's I've got something for you. So. Um, the Native, Native Americans here, um, in Alaska, some of them in the far north, they're polar bear hunters where they would, mm-hmm. you know, take a polar bear's life and they'd always, they'd bring in oh. the head by the fire and they would say, yeah. they would come, yeah, they would come and they would My say like, Hey, man. I respect you. I honor you. And the polar bears, you know, part of the family, it's like the system of honoring. And it's like, Hey, if, if I'm going to go to anybody. I might as well go with this guy. Like I'm going to give myself to him. Same thing with moose. The native Americans will say, you don't pick your moose. Your, your moose picks you mm-hmm. because you've obviously been like a, a good hunter. You're going to honor the animal and bring it back. And, you know, like I would like to think if um, and some people like if I, if when I die, I want to be reincarnated and come back as like a saber tooth tiger, a liger, <laughs> you know, like a snow <laughs> leopard, something like real aggressive and Eagle. And I'm kind of like, Man, if I was to go and come back, I'd want to be a doll sheep. I want to live amongst mountains. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a prey, but like I'm one of the most handsome prey out there. And I sit <laughs> up on top of the mountain and I'm looking down on everything, kind of like, I see you trying to get me, but you're not going to get me. I'm yeah. going to go up to my castle and hide out. But they're just to me like one of the most handsome creatures. And there's 
there's all sorts of honor. That's why I do bring the animal heads back and like I tax Germium because I think back, it's just a, it's a physical representation of the memories that were made. And that's all that is because the meat's going to be long gone. Um, and you know and when I mean? I'm long gone, I don't know what my kids are going to do with, you know, all of my trophies, whether they, you know, sell it to a, um, a dog chew factory or something like that. I don't the Smithsonian there's you know some of these trophies do have um value in the sense that we were at the Smithsonian and there were some narwhal exhibits that were on loan from private collectors and without those like I mean for my daughters and for me too which narwhals are um mm -hmm. local to Alaska to actually see that in a museum in DC I was like wow I've never even seen one of those where I grew up um you know what I would come back as if if well, in spirit animal, spirit animal. Real, mm -hmm. a, a squaw squatch a bigfoot which You'd just for fun would you be an albino or like a golden one? Oh, golden, golden for sure. Golden, golden, for sure. golden hair. Where would you uh, live? Glass glass. British Columbia? Pacific Northwest. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. then you've got like the fishing, the hunting, mm -hmm. low populations, relatively settled, temperate climate, tech, Pacific Northwest for sure. Well, I've got something for you about like Squatch. And like Let's I said over that podcast. Yes, but, Wild um, Thing is the podcast. Check it out. She does a great job. Laura Cramps is her name. Basically, they don't have a specimen of, of, of Sasquatch. Yeah. So if I was out hunting, it's like uh, hunters talk about this. Well, what do you do? You've got a rifle and you see this, you know, primate. Yeah. Killer capture. Wood, that's the debate. You, yeah. So that's the whole thing. How do you cap? I wouldn't be able to capture a Sasquatch. Come on. If this thing's a primate, I wouldn't be able to fight a chimpanzee. Those things are mean and strong. <laughs> so there's no way you're going to be able to catch them. But if you, if you see one, and you shoot it, then you'll have a, a specimen where they'll lay it out yeah. and put it in the museum, take it to places and they've got a scientific specimen. But if you see it and you're like, yeah, I, I, I saw it. And then you start to tell people about yeah, it. Yeah, and then, then you're, you're the crazy person who talks about it. I always might, say that. I want to see a Bigfoot a so bad. Yeah. Look at us. We're getting so zinged up about Bigfoot. This is what we should oh, have talked about the whole stinking show. I've never seen one. I've never seen one, but I don't know if I did. Yeah. Hypothetically. Even. If I would I, actually shoot it, and then if I would just take it, I probably wouldn't even tell you because you'd get me back on here and it would be like, "There's this well, dude called no well, like, to, If if Bigfoot is, Big is a real creature and not just a mythical creation of our collective imagination, then it would. I mean, the future of hunting or farming, farming in the region it's, it resides, it would just fundamentally uproot our nation. I had an interview with a scientist named Dean Radin a couple shows ago, and he was talking about putting consciousness as a fundamental ele element of like our belief structures and how it mm -hmm. would change so many things, but then a lot of things would stay the same. And I wonder the same thing about Bigfoot. Oh my gosh, we could talk about this at length. Sometimes when I'm having a hard time sleeping, I will literally just imagine myself in a forest meeting Bigfoot. And then I like go off into lucid dreaming land and that's my happy space. But with that, it's time to go. Um, <laughs> I know what of we, we will. I'll have to have you back I'll on to talk about it. Bigfoot. Okay. Um, thank you so much for listening, and be sure to follow Golden Otter Divinations on Instagram as well as Mission AK, where you can check in with me and let me know about all your golden moments. So Spirit and I can cheer you on, and Austin can cheer you on in all of your outdoors outdoor adventures. Also, if you'd like to contact me, Autumn, or join my monthly manifesting membership, Lunar Manifestations, visit my website, goldenotter.us. That's golden like the precious metal and otter like the precious animal. Please take a moment to sign up for my biweekly email and get up-to-date information on all things golden otter. I want to thank my guest today, Mission Alaska founder, Austin Manelik, for sharing a wealth of information on reconnecting with our ancestral roots. And I want to thank you all for tuning into Golden Otter Radio. I had an amazing time sharing this sacred co-creation space with you. Have a great week and I'll feel your vibes back here next time. Thanks so much for joining us, Austin. Thanks for having me on, Otto. <laughs> Bye. Thank you for listening to Golden Otter Divinations, where the metaphysical meets the mainstream with Autumn Seibel. Tune in the first Friday of every month at 9 a.m. Pacific on TransformationTalkRadio.com. Exploring where the metaphysical meets the mainstream, Golden Otter Divinations helps you draw in the abundance that is yours by divine right. For more information or to listen to this show, visit goldenotter.us. That's golden like the precious metal and otter like the precious animal.us.